Bienvenidas, bienvenidos todos. Es un placer estar aquí nuevamente con ustedes en eh, otro de los eventos de esta 35 edición del Festival de Cine de Mar del Plata. Eh, nos llena de alegría poder eh, estar eh, presentes, eh, aunque más no sea de esta forma, y estar cerca de todos ustedes, que seguramente son muchos más de los que año tras año vienen a Mar del Plata. El festival está alcanzando una audiencia mucho mayor, mucho más grande, y eso nos llena de alegría y de orgullo. Muchas gracias de nuevo y muchas gracias por formar parte de esto, que es la charla, las preguntas y respuestas posteriores al visionado de la película Sophie Jones. Si no vieron la película, lo recomendable es primero ver la película porque vamos a hablar de cuestiones de la trama y si no la vieron, no pudieron verla, por lo menos escuchen todo lo que tiene para decir su directora. Vamos a hablar de Sophie Jones entonces con Jesse Barr, eh, una película que forma parte de la competencia internacional y que nos llena de alegría poder tener una película con tanto espíritu libre y, y tanta celebración de lo que es el crecer, ser mujer, ser joven, encontrarse en un mar de contradicciones y buscar la forma de salir adelante en esa difícil tarea que es conocerse a uno mismo. Hola Jessy, ¿cómo estás? Hi Pablo, thank you so much for having the film. It really means so much. This is such an honor and um, I'm so happy to speak with you. Lo mismo, nos da mucha, mucha alegría. Bueno, como decía recién, eh, la película nos, nos, nos gustó mucho, nos parece una película muy interesante por su punto de vista, eh, por, por, por el tema que, que trata, pero sobre todo por el enfoque que tiene. Contanos un poco cómo llegan vos y su protagonista, contanos quién es su protagonista y cómo llegan a el guión de esta película. Sure. So um, originally there was an early, early draft of the film, different title, different structure as well. But the heart of the character of Sophie Jones was there. My younger cousin, also named Jessica Barr, who stars in the film as Sophie Jones, she um, sent me a very early draft of this of this film she was working on. And we share both the same name. Our parents were brothers named after our great grandmother, but we also both share a loss. We share the loss of a parent when we were both 16 years old. So there's a very strange synchronicity. Our names, the exact same age when we lost you know, a parent. And so when she sent me this early draft of, of the script, I just completely cracked open. I, I feel like, um, unlike Jessica who had, has been very open about her loss and, and talking about her grieving process. Uh, I never spoke about losing my father and I never spoke about that experience of loss um, for 16 years. It was, I had been alive uh, without him as long as I had been alive with him. And oddly enough, and I just, I do believe in this, that's when we started connecting, Jessica and I, that's when we started working on the script together. And I think I was finally ready to give voice to not just my experience, but our shared experience of loss, that trauma that we'd experienced. Also giving voice to that um, specific time in, in uh, young adulthood, this transition of girlhood to womanhood and how fraught that is and how confusing that is and giving voice to an experience with authenticity, with reverence, without judgment. So it, it's kind of wild. I feel like once we started working on the script together and sharing our own experiences about what that was like, losing our parents, you know, I found ways to incorporate a lot of my experience and her experience at, at once. And also I really wanted to make it, of course, a scripted narrative, but I wanted there to be um, a reflexivity and a mirroring, if that makes sense. So Of course, I knew she had to play the character of Sophie. We talked about what that would be like. So it's not a documentary. It is scripted. But of course, you know, we're folding in our experiences and our our real, um, yeah, our, our our losses and what that was like. So it is sort of an interesting um, mix of documentary and narrative. And that's something that liminal space I'm really, really interested in um, and finding the heart of that and sort of the poetry of the ordinary and the truth of that se nota que hay mucho trabajo en ese aspecto y, y, y mucho de lo que se logra a partir de eso es la frescura que hay, que tienen no solo Sophie, la, el personaje protagónico interpretado por Jessica, como bien decías, sino todos los involucrados. Hay, hay un trabajo ahí de improvisación, ¿cómo fue el momento de, 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 de plantearse frente a la cámara de, de, de todo el equipo? So, I come from an acting background, I studied as an actor in theater, 
And I think um, a lot of the techniques and the tools and the way I approach um, working on film, and especially film like this, where so many of the actors, it was their first time ever acting on camera. So Jessica also, you know, carrying this whole movie and it was her first time, Skylar Verite, who plays Kevin, one of her main love interests in the film, had acted in some films, but you know, it was really about making the actors feel as comfortable as possible. And also really listening and being present to and receiving you know, what's in front of you. So for example, um, I really wanted to explore the characters and have parts of the actors come through in an organic way. So Skylar, for example, we were um, all in LA for some reason, they all happened to be here and I had them rehearse at my apartment. I was filming them on my 5D and we were sort of, you know, exploring improv in and out of scenes. I was giving them exercises and I took them out for lunch um, for, just some restaurant to talk. And he let me know he sang and he was a musician and he had never revealed that until that lunch. And it was about like a week or two before shooting something like very, and I was like, oh my gosh, you're telling me this now. So I wanted to find a way to incorporate his natural skill and talent in an organic way that would serve the film. So I thought I knew there was gonna be a montage of Sophie and Kevin reconnecting and sort of her falling in love with him and his boyishness and his innocence and, um, openness is sort of a direct antithesis to her sort of like closed off, very, you know, uh, defensive, um, sometimes very blunt, you know, curt, angry exterior. So I thought how perfect, what if he, you know, teaches her guitar? What if he sings her a song? And in that moment, I actually had never heard his music. I didn't know if he was talented. I didn't know if he was terrible, but I knew even if it was terrible, it would work in the moment because she's falling in love with him and his vulnerability and he is creating a vulnerability in her. So when we shot that, um, it, that was an improvised, you know, experience. Of course, I facilitated that. We there was a lot of sort of setting the atmosphere, but then just really letting them go and me feeding little things here and there. And he just broke out into the most extraordinary song, and I just will never forget it. Everyone was weeping. I was weeping behind the monitor, um, and seeing Jessica be touched by Skylar's song was also Sophie being touched by Kevin's, you know yeah, music and his heart. So that that was a way to fold in working with the actors in a way that felt really natural and organic and safe. Sí, totalmente. Todo eso se siente, eh, como se siente también el trabajo muy, muy certero en la búsqueda de la intimidad, de la intimidad compartida, de la intimidad propia, ¿no? De Sophie y de con su interacción a solas con su mejor amiga, con alguno de los chicos con los que está y con la dinámica que tiene con cada uno, y sobre todo la soledad de ella, ¿no? Esa soledad a medias entre el dolor y el tratar de, 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 de hacer ruido, de sacar esa, la parte más triste o dura de esa soledad, ¿no? Hay como mucho trabajo en eso, en, el, en la intimidad. Yes, thank you for, for noticing that. Yes, not only, and I think in the romantic relationships and, and sort of her searching for um, just feeling, uh, we talked about this a lot. Um, and Jessica and I talked about, you know, this idea of like eroticism as the antidote to death. Oftentimes when we're in these traumatic moments, um, we experience a disassociation, right? Like a leaving the body and a numbness. And so Sophie, a lot of her, sort of mechanism to feel again, to ground herself in her body, to feel alive again is through intimacy, is through, you know, kissing, hot breath, touch, pressure, pulsation. And so there's this searching for being embodied again after having an experience of loss that disembodies you, you know, pulls the rug out from you, sort of pulls the veil off the world. So having the experience of her throwing herself into these relationships, none of which are sustaining, right? And none of which are going to like solve her problem. Because that was another thing that was so important um, that the film reflect is that at the end, Sophie chooses herself, you know, it's, it's her experience with herself and her finding her own way, but also through opening up to another young girl, Lily, played by Elaine in the film, in that scene in the car, the two of them, it's one of the only moments where we see Sophie sort of going outside of herself and thinking of another and sharing in another's pain and loss. And that moment of compassion and empathy and intimacy that comes from really being present to someone else's 
pain and humanity, which um, at no matter what age you are, I think that's really possible. And a lot of times in coming of age films with, you know, teens, I think there's a lot of talking down to teenagers and a lot of sort of, um, you know, seeing them as fickle or over the top or melodramatic. And yes, there's so many Shakespearean, you know, themes in coming of age films, like things do feel like life and death. They are. And giving that um, respect was so important to me and to really, yeah, create that space for the characters to, to be in, in an intimate relationship with one another that wasn't saccharine, but was tender and was really truthful. Me ganaste con, esa, con ese tema, yo te iba a preguntar precisamente por el momento de, de, de diálogo con Lili, que me parece que también es, es eh, eh, el momento en el que Sophie trata de leerse desde afuera, ¿no? de, 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 de cómo verbalizar esto que está viviendo, que es como un estado de, de, de carne viva, de, 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 de nervios afuera, de, 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 de exteriorización, de, de, de esa indecisión, de ese, de ese en, tratar de encontrarse. Eh, ¿Cómo fue ese trabajo, mm. ese momento de, de, de rodaje con Lilia en el coche? Yeah, again, I think so much of it about, especially working with um, actors that are newer actors or, um, you know, is really about creating this space, creating the sense of safety. So, you know, I really, um, my cinematographer, Scott Miller, who's extraordinary and who, Really, I, I say he's like a bodhisattva. He just has such a vulnerability and a tenderness. And when he is moving in the scene, he's dancing with the camera. And it's so, so his, um, I'd, I'd worked with him as an actor. So I knew what it was like to be seen by him through the camera. And that's also why I knew that given these really intimate emotional scenes, he could create a, a container for, for these young women to, to really go to these places that that were necessary for the film. So that scene with Lily and Sophie, we spent a lot of time just sitting in the car together, letting them sit together. Um, also uh, the actress uh, Elle who plays Lily had also lost her um, mother. So that was also, again, another true experience of someone, a young person, we all shared that. So I talked a lot about um, I remember if if their mothers, if they came in to sort of visit in their imaginations, allowing them to be there with them, it almost felt like they were sitting in the back seat of the car with these two, you know, with Lily, with Sophie, with Jessica, with Elle, you know, it felt um, very pregnant, that space. So it was really just about encouraging them to take their time to really talk a lot about breath, dropping the jaw, relaxing and letting that um the emotion or the truth come through and not trying to clamp down on it or create a desired outcome, you know? So there were some moments where there were tears. There were some where there were not tears. You know, I wanted to be very, um, ha have variations and not let them, not make them feel like they had to deliver something in that moment. It was really just letting them feel safe enough to take each other in, to really listen not act listening, but really listen and respond and feel from each other um, what the other one was giving. And then I think when you do that, it's, there's just something that occurs. It doesn't, it's hard to explain. There is a structure to it, but there's also something else that is hard, hard to describe. Um, I hope I answered your question. No, no, excelente, excelente respuesta, sin duda, eh, sin duda. Eh, como bien decís, vos trabajaste con tu prima que tiene básicamente una diferencia de edad, este, casi el doble de edad tenés de ella aproximadamente o algo así. ¿Crees que cambió mucho? A, a decade apart, yeah. Una, una década, exacto. ¿Crees que en esta década, desde tu experiencia personal, desde, no, no solo de, desde la experiencia de la pérdida, sino desde la forma de encarar el mundo, ¿crees que... que el, las jóvenes adolescentes de hoy guardan algún tipo de similitud con lo, con lo que te tocó vivir a vos 10 años atrás? ¿Hay, hay algo, hay una, un avance, un retroceso, algo en la juventud hoy, de acuerdo a todo lo que viste y viviste con el, el realizar la película? Es so interesting. Um, I think, although, you know, time 
there's always going to be shared, you know, similarities, regardless of, you know, I did grow up with the internet and these, these, you know, these actors also have the internet, but, but it, um, I forget who said it, but we have moved in a lot of ways from the age of uh, information to the age of influence. And so I do notice um, anxiety in a way in, in today's, you know, the culture of, of um, teenagers that, that is perhaps, I don't know if I could say more exacerbated than when I was a teenager, but the, the thing that, I, that strikes me the most is that regardless of when you're a teenager, there is always that energy of becoming, this like questing and this search and this desire for becoming. So yes, of course, there's so much more now that a lot of teenagers do have to deal with. Um, and I was thinking about it the other day, like, whereas if I had something embarrassing happen to me, you know, it wouldn't be posted all over the internet. Whereas now that's a reality, right? That like, I was bullied in middle school, but when I went home, it ended. Whereas if you're bullied in middle school now, it continues online when you get home. So there's sort of this inescapable quality that can cause, yes, like heightened anxiety. But at the same time, something I found really interesting about, um, we shot in Portland and again, using a lot of, um, people that my cousin knew and was comfortable with so that we could, you know, build off those relationships. But there was also something interesting about growing up in, in Portland, in Oregon, with all this natural beauty and natural landscape. Like, yes, they were, you know, drawn to phones, but there was also something, I don't know, it was different than, than growing up in like a city and being so obsessed with technology because you could go jump, you know, in the river, you could go on a drive, you know, past large bodies of water. There's so much hiking, you know, the waterfalls. I think it, the relationship to nature and the outdoors specifically in Portland um, was really part of the texture of the film that I wanted to incorporate. So yeah, it's, I guess it's a difficult question to answer but hopefully there's something in there that's useful. Hay, hay una buena respuesta ahí, sí, no te preocupes, y sí, claramente, te estoy haciendo una pregunta que implica, que, que implica millones de, de, de posibilidades de, de, de amplitud de respuesta. <risa> eh, así que dejémoslo, que está más que bien lo que, lo que sí. respondiste, está clarísimo que tenés muy, muy en claro la película que hiciste y la búsqueda que tuviste todo el tiempo, vos, tu prima y todo el equipo que trabajó en el, en, en el largometraje. Me, me parece, hablaste de tu director de fotografía, yo también quería destacar su trabajo porque, porque logra acompañar todos los humores de, 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 de la película y, y también eso está muy reforzado por la música, ¿cómo fue el trabajo de, de, de encontrar la canción perfecta? ¿Tenías primero las canciones y después eh, filmaste para, para ilustrarlas? ¿Cómo fue todo ese trabajo? Porque hay un una dedicación muy específica y puntual, ¿no? Yeah, so, well, Scott Miller and I, as I, I said, he was just, he's incredible, and he is so game, and he, I mean, even in, our, we did like a week of, of um, pre-production, just him and I, and he actually slept over in the house where we shot, which is actually Jessica's real house. Um, it's since been sold, but I remember he like, we were talking about how we're very, we're both very into process. We're both very into immersion. And thank goodness he was into it because he literally slept in the house and was sending me photos of like, you know, the rooms at night. And, and I shared, you know, so much music with him, both music that I like listened to when I was a teenager, but also just music now that felt like angsty and raw. And, and I wanted the voices of young women, of girls, like I wanted the music, um, not, not the score with Nate Heller, which I'll speak to in a moment, but some of the, the needle drops, you know, I wanted it to have this sort of power and this ferocity. And I wanted it to sound like it was like girls in the basement next door that could be banging and making this sound. Um, and actually a few of the songs are from Beverly, Um, and one of my friends from college, Drew Citron, is the lead singer. And I've been obsessed with her music forever. I feel like I've used one of her songs in everything I've made, in the series I made, a short I made. She just encapsulates this, I don't know, there's this tension in her music that feels both like ethereal, but also really powerful. Um, so that, that, the sound of those needle drops, I really, I knew exactly 
what I wanted that to feel like and sound like. And then we worked with this incredible boutique license agent, uh, licensing agency, the uh, Crystal Creative in Portland, and they were just phenomenal and helped us find a lot of local um, bands, both from Oregon and also from uh, Oakland to really create that sound. Um, and then in terms of the score, Nate Heller, is just an incredible musician. He's sort of like a wizard, he can do anything. And when I was talking to him, I knew I wanted there to be a lot of quiet in the film um, and just breath and the sounds, sort of like these pregnant pauses. And I knew I wanted those moments of the, the needle drops where Sophie's trying to sort of um, obliterate herself in the music, you know, lose herself in the music, but also these moments of her when she's alone, where I wanted us, you know, the atmospheric sort of the sound of bells and the layering of these more natural sounds, almost soundscapey when I was talking to Nate. And that was to me more about her interior, interior world and really her mother and the sort of, this sort of, um, like a hummingbird wing, like a ghost, like a, an echo, this sort of thing that she, maybe can't quite connect to yet or listen to yet. And eventually she does in that scene where she actually speaks out to her mother. So Nate and I worked a lot on, and it was hard because he can do so much. And I kept wanting to be like, no, less, less, strip it back, you know, less, just like the, like a sort of ghost whisper of bells is all we need, you know? And then the final song um, that he created at the end of the film which was really, he's extraordinary. His, his um, niece sang, she's the vocalist, her name is Isis. And she, I sent him poems. I sent him an Anne Sexton poem. I sent him some Mary Oliver poems, some poems. Um, I remember when I was 16, uh, Gertrude Schnackenberg poems. And he wrote the song for the final scene. Um, and I knew I wanted it to be like a, a sort of pilgrimage, you know, them in the car, the family, them getting out, them walking through those winding woods and then the vista to the ocean. And originally when we put in tent music, um, my editor and I, Naomi Sunrise Filamoro, there was no vocal on that track. I wasn't expecting a vocal. And then I went to him and he played me this song with Isis's so intimate. And there's almost like a fairy like quality or childlike quality to it. And it just, it was like more than I could have imagined. But then instead of it being a whole song that takes us all the way to the end, I wanted it to devolve. I knew it had to fragment because I didn't want the end to be tied up in a bow. Because for me and for, I just feel like everyone I speak to, especially now, it's it's like normalizing grief and normalizing that grief, is it's not binary and it, and it doesn't end. There's no end. There's only a sort of transformation. So having that song and the childlike vocal of Isis over, you know, the two sisters over Lucy played by uh, Charlie Jackson, who's also extraordinary, her and, and um, Jessica as Sophie and Dave Roberts as the father as Aaron, having them walk and having Isis's vocal and then having it devolve into just um, instrumental into then just the sounds of the waves and the water and the air um, was something that, we came to as we were working through that. And, and I'm so glad that Nate was willing to trust me <laughs> as I totally ruined his beautiful song <laughs> and like stripped it down. Pero me parece que la potenciaste y, y eso potenció a la película y esa, esa última escena que como bien decís, no es algo, eh, no es un momento de superación, sino de aceptación y de, 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 de entender que eso es como se tiene que avanzar con esa, con esa ausencia y esa presencia a la vez, ¿no? Eh, hay, hay, es, es un momento lírico muy interesante el, el cierre, que conecta también con ese comienzo que no terminamos de entender qué es lo que está pasando, esa, esa, esos dos primeros planos, tres primeros planos, que la vemos a ella con una caja, medio que no se entiende hasta ese final. Right, yeah, that starts with her and hopefully people have seen the film otherwise, I guess we're spoiling it, but that she's um, literally tasting her mother's ashes. You know, she's trying to be closer to her. She's trying to feel her and bring her into herself. And then the moments at the end, it's also this, um, you know, the story is of course, it's called Sophie Jones, it's about Sophie, but we also open up to her family. We have much more scenes as she opens up, as she becomes more vulnerable, as she explores her grief and her experience. We get more scenes with the family, with Lucy, with Aaron, 
it, it expands the story. And then we see them all releasing the ashes in their own unique way. And she goes from, right, ingesting them to releasing them, um, which, which, yeah, sort of takes us through that, uh, that narrative. And I do want to speak to just because Scott, again, I can't, he's just so amazing. Um, so created such a, a trusting relationship with all the actors. And that moment at the end when um, the focus goes soft and Sophie sort of falls out of shot into the next moment and we cut to black. To me, that always just felt like, and I love hearing what other people think about that moment, but it's like, I see her, you know, falling into the next moment in her life, you know, that yes, this is an end, but of course in every end, there's a beginning and there's a transformation. Exacto, una transformación que no solo no solo pasa por, por esa aceptación y por esa determinación a avanzar a pesar de, y entendiendo el, el, el peso de esa pérdida y cómo es algo con lo cual ella tiene que vivir, sino también un, un, un cierre con respecto a, a su, su relación con Kevin, que es muy interesante porque termina, al, al decirle un poco lo que siente, es un poco también darse cuenta ella finalmente cuál es el vínculo y qué es lo que la une a, lo une a ella, ¿no? Yeah, I think it's really oftentimes when we're inside of something, especially a relationship like that and a and a young, you know, love like that, we don't really know the power of it and the weight of it until it's over. Um and that um oftentimes when you have relationships after these, you know, extreme times of trauma, there's an intense closeness between those people that happens. And yeah, I really do love that moment where she acknowledges that how he was there for her and he really saw her in a way that she was afraid to be seen. And although they're not going to end up together, you know, it's okay because that's what That's, I mean, who knows, you know, maybe they find each other or maybe they become friends or, or maybe not, maybe that's it. Maybe that's all that it was. But in, in that meeting of each other's, you know, hearts in that intimate way, that's everything, you know, what, it, what a gift that is. Y además un, un, un regalo del cual eh, su amiga Claire ya le había, le había avisado que no, no pasaba, ¿no? que los hombres no te, no te dan bola, no te escuchan, no te contienen, no les interesa todo ese costado. Descubrir, la, descubrir todo, todo por ella misma me parece que era necesario y es un poco el viaje que se plantea en la película. Es mm. so interesting, yeah, I think we all sort of project our own experience, right? Not just when you're a teenager, but I even find as adults, it's like, oh, this is how it is this is what's going to happen to you because this is what happened to me. And people love to, to do that. And Claire, Claire does that, of course, to protect her friend because she doesn't want her to be hurt, but also, of course, because Claire has been hurt. And so I think, I think you're right, that idea that you can listen to all the advice in the world, but at the end of the day, you have to have your own experiences and you have to come to your own conclusions and you have to live your own life and that includes a lot of mistakes <laughs> and that includes um a lot of messiness but ultimately that's yeah the most hopefully fulfilling thing to just embrace the sort of that necessary part of of being human hermosas palabras sin lugar a duda eh, bueno, vamos cerrando un poco, pero me gustaría que nos cuentes, porque la verdad es que si hay algo que, que, que nos sorprendió, que nos gratamente sorprendió de, de la película, es, es, es que hay una, muy, una gran madurez en la forma en que narrás eh, y en la forma en que te relacionás con los personajes y en esa búsqueda de ser realista desde un lugar fresco y, 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 y honesto con, lo, con el universo que estás reflejando. ¿Hay algo, alguna... Influencia cinematográfica, literaria, ¿de dónde crees que viene un poco todo esto más allá de, de tu formación? For sure. I mean, I, I, I love documentaries. I watch a lot of documentaries and a lot of foreign films. I love Celine Schiama. I love Alice Rowacher. I love, um, they're just so, so many. I, I watched a lot of, um, yeah, Andrea Arnold, Fish Tank. I watched, um, 
we are the best Lucas Woody son, you know, a lot of these teenage um, films, but that are, that are not the typical sort of American coming of age films. Um, I think just cause I find uh, turn me on, damn it, is, is a great one. Um, I just find there there's like an intelligence and uh, really respecting the intelligence of the audience that I that I really care about deeply um, and trusting the audience to intuit um, and even with you know the the music not wanting to use it as a prescriptive um, wanting to just help. Um, people feel what is happening in an immersive way and come to their own, you know, conclusions, but have it be very experiential. So yes, a lot of, um, a lot of foreign films, a lot of documentaries, I read a lot. And yeah, so a lot of poetry, a lot of poems, as I said, Anne Sexton, Mary Oliver, uh, Gertrude Schnockenberg, a lot of photography as well. Um, uh, Rania Matar has a series called Mothers and Daughters and also a series about girls in their rooms. And, you know, when you think about um, what space is like your entire world, your room is your, you know, your entire universe or your car, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a car. So these, um, I love being dropped into worlds, very specific worlds. And so those images really fed me a lot. Um, and yeah, just really... I love that um, film is, is, and I think this was, I just, uh, Celine Sciamma's words, but it's a transmission of our intimacies. And um, I think my hope is that this film is a way to accompany people and also for you to feel accompanied. So um, yeah, those are some, some I guess of the, the influences and the, the images and the sounds and also just being, being, um, as I said, like present to the spaces when I was scouting in Portland and when I was seeing, you know, the light and I was looking at how much at the time there was so much water in the air and all the lichen on the trees and like what that does to your own feeling in your body when there's like this weight in the air, um, how that affects you really being alive to what's actually present too. So it's not just me trying, cause this is just personally not, I'm just not interested in like creating this thing in my brain and then using people like puppets to make it. It's so much more interesting and fulfilling to me if it's, if it's, you know, extraordinary planning and hard work and lots of and influences, but also collaboration and listening to what's really happening. Um, and respecting it. Uh, so that's, yeah, I think that all of that sort of confluence of events and experiences went into, um, went into the film. And I think I was afraid for a long time about sort of acknowledging the truth of, of my story about that loss. And I think creating this film was also an extraordinary way to free myself of that fear um, and to step into that fear and that vulnerability. And I know, I hope, you know, people um, might feel that as well for, for themselves and might inspire something. Tiene, sin lugar a duda, un costado terapéutico la película y es muy bienvenido. <laughs> muy bienvenido. Um, bueno, eh, contanos un poco para despedirnos en qué estás, cuáles son tus, tus próximos proyectos, si, si es que estás en... en en algo más allá de, de promover la película, que yeah. es lo que estás haciendo ahora. Right, well, um, yes, I've been writing a lot. Um, I have uh, a pilot with one of my friends that I'm developing with uh, the Sundance um, that we've been working on this whole time during, um, you know, since March, I guess I would say. And then I also have another pilot that I'm working on on my own that would take place in in Oregon because I love it so much and it deals with some of the coming of age themes because I just can't get enough of that. <laughs> um, I always find it endlessly fascinating. And then I also have a feature script that, um, that I'm writing as well. So lots of things in development, writing, um, and also trying to, yeah, be present with the film and, and sharing it and, um, and filling up artistically too. Perfecto. Bueno, hasta aquí llegamos. Muchas, muchas gracias por tu tiempo. Muchas gracias a todos los que y todas los que nos están viendo. 
eh, es un placer una vez más eh, poder contar con Sophie Jones en nuestra competencia internacional, esperamos hayan disfrutado de la película, muchas gracias Jesse. mandale un saludo muy muy cordial, con mucho amor desde nuestro lado a, a todo el elenco y a todo el equipo técnico han logrado una pequeña joyita. Thank you so much, really. We, we are so deeply honored, truly. And thank you, Pablo, for this conversation. Muchas, muchas gracias. <laughs>